Hey guys, Tom here. Uh, this is a Q&A video and we have lots of questions, so I'm just gonna get straight into it. If you want to ask a question for these Q&A videos in future, I pretty much always put them on my community posts page uh, on YouTube, so turn your notifications on for the channel and that way you will see any time I put a post up or put a new video up uh, and you can make sure to get your question answered in a future video. Now, um, I'm gonna answer a couple of questions up front that were uh, repeated many times and asked in kind of a couple of different forms and then and I'm just going to kind of go through the questions in the order they came in and see how many I can get through. Now, uh, I am probably going to skip over a couple here just because uh, there were some questions that I've answered in very recent q and so I don't want to kind of double up on them. Um, but with all that said, this quick intro is getting a little bit long, so let's just get straight into it and start answering some questions. Okay, so the first question I got, which is kind of unrelated to stock market investing, but is quite related to the random picture that I put on that community post asking for Q&A questions, um, was just kind of around the fish that was in the photo. So um, for anyone not from New Zealand, uh, or maybe even some people that are from New Zealand, but that aren't into fishing, that is a New Zealand yellowtail kingfish. Uh, that was about a meter 20, 120 centimeters uh, in the conversion charts. That comes out at about 22 kilos. Uh, we didn't actually weigh it. It was kind of a fat one, so it may have been slightly more than 22 kilos. Uh, it tasted great. We utilized every last bit of it. Um, and I really like fishing and hope to do more of it in the couple of months through summer. So uh, that was the first question we had. Uh, the other one we had in a couple of different forms were just my thoughts on the recent A2 uh, Milk earnings downgrade that just came out kind of uh, towards the end of this week. Um, so I'm actually going to put together a full video on breaking down that A2 Milk uh, earnings guidance, earnings downgrade that come out um, and update some of my valuations. But long story short, those updates to guidance for the A2 Milk company do genuinely impact the intrinsic value of A2 Milk. They are not going to earn as much money out into the future as I previously thought they were and as many people previously thought they were. Uh, and if a business doesn't earn as much money out into the future, then it has a lower value. <laughs> and really, whether or not you think A2 Milk is undervalued or overvalued at this kind of lower price, um, and my valuations really depends on whether you think that this is a short term event or kind of a longer term event that might take um, sort of two, three, four years for A2 Milk to kind of bounce back from and get to, you know, record profits and all that sort of stuff again. So that's kind of the quick and dirty uh, answer to your question, but I'm going to be doing a full video on that one uh, coming up very soon. Okay, next question we have is from Jeb Vorm. Do you see value in the Japanese stock market? Um, so I've never really looked particularly closely at too many Japanese stocks. Uh, I had a bit of a look at the three or four that Warren Buffett bought into earlier in the year, and I actually did a video with um, Brandon from the New Money YouTube channel on that topic. Um, and that was kind of an interesting bet. From my perspective, it looked like Buffett was kind of betting on the Japanese economy in general doing really well relative to the you know valuations on those businesses that, that he could buy them at. Um, but the other interesting thing with that particular bet was Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett were also able to borrow some money really, really cheaply, like dramatically lower than the dividend yields that they were going to get off these companies. So it sort of looked like um, he was almost capturing like an arbitrage by borrowing money at close to 0% interest in Japanese yen, and then putting that into sort of large Japanese corporations that are going to earn much more than 0% over the long term. So Kind of interesting, uh, I know Monish Prabhai did some hunting in uh, Japan not too long ago as well. So interesting area to watch for sure, um, but I'm yet to purchase into any sort of Japanese stocks. Okay, next question we have is from Stephen. How about tax for New Zealand citizen if investing in the US stock market? Um, I know I have disclaimers in a lot of my videos that I'm not a financial advisor, um, and I do genuinely mean that, like if you've got financial really sort of personalized financial advice questions that you need answered i'm not the person to come to uh, when it comes to taxation i'm definitely not the person to come to so um, i personally have hired an accountant for the first time just this year uh, not only for my stock market investing but also my tax in general is getting a little bit more complicated with income from youtube uh, and sponsors of the youtube channel and that sort of stuff as well so um, that is definitely one you should seek professional advice on um, in my experience the sort of um, taxation on share investing from New Zealand can be kind of like a gray area as to whether you think you're a long-term investor or a trader and how the IRD kind of defines that. So definitely an area where you should be getting some personal advice. In my opinion, uh, investing in a good accountant is actually kind of one of the best investments you can make, particularly if you're running a business and you have expenses that you want to write off and do all that sort of stuff. So um, definitely get some professional advice on that one if you do have any concerns. 
Uh, so next question is from ND. What do you think of Chamath's style of investing? He's trying to build our generation's book Hathaway. Yeah, so I watched some of Chamath's stuff when he's like interviewed on CNBC and that, that sort of thing. Um, and he definitely invests in more sort of modern um, businesses than uh, a lot of people do and than I do. Certainly more modern than someone like Warren Buffett does. But he's also investing oftentimes in very early stage companies, which um, sort of by default, you have a lot of kind of potential home runs built into that basket of businesses that you can acquire very very early on and you know do very well from an investment perspective um, but you're also going to have a lot of donuts a lot of zeros when you're kind of playing that venture capital type game um, and in the VC world you're kind of hoping that your winners outweigh your losers and you know you, you get the next Uber or pick up something like that so um, it's not really a style of investing per se that fits with my strategy all that well um, but certainly is a super insightful guy and I, I do watch some of the stuff that he puts out so that's that uh jack asks getting any closer to buying a piece of real estate um <laughs> Yeah, interesting question. So I'm actually going to be doing another video coming up soon, kind of updating my goals for 2020 and how I kind of got on with them and then setting some new goals for 2021. Uh, and one of my new goals for 2021 is going to be to buy a piece of real estate. So as it stands right now, um, there's not any deals that I kind of have on the table or anything that I'm looking at just yet, but that's certainly something I want to tick off in uh, 2021. Okay, Luke McKee asks, how do you price Bitcoin? I know it's a buzz question and we had a few sort of Bitcoin questions throughout here. Uh, all that I personally know about Bitcoin is only what I've learned from Bitcoin bro when he's turned up on the channel here. So uh, in all seriousness, it's really not a topic I understand particularly well. Um, and it's been kind of interesting. Like uh, there's always lots of kind of crypto currency um, content on YouTube and that kind of comes into the comment section as well. Unfortunately, it's often associated with some of the like spam and scam comments that I get which is another topic and kind of a, a, a big issue with the finance world on YouTube, as you've probably seen, and as you'll probably see in the comment section of this video, it's kind of that bad. But um, in terms of actually buying into Bitcoin and how I price it or how I think about the price, it's not something I understand. It's it's not a productive asset. It's not like a business or a piece of real estate that throws off cash and you can kind of value those future cash flows and come up with an appropriate price. Um, so, you know, it's not an area that I've ever stepped into. Um, and I know a lot of people have done really well in it recently. A lot of people got burnt a few years ago. And if you look at sort of three, five year returns, uh, you know, it's actually pretty comparable, if not slightly below stocks. Um, so I prefer to stick to an area I understand, you know, if Bitcoin goes and races off into the future and goes to a million dollars per Bitcoin or something, I'm sure I'll, I'll live to regret not putting one or two percent of my net worth into that. But um, I like to stick with stuff that I know. So I'm certainly not the person to come to for um, for Bitcoin advice or anything like that. So uh, Kalichi Waba asks, how would you value a company like Airbnb that does not have the long term history to do a DC, I assume you mean DCF? Uh, but has what would appear to be a major growth potential ahead. Um, yeah, interesting. I mean, again, it's kind of goes into the Chamath sort of discussion where it's just not an area that I play in. And um, one of the important things I think to understand with investing is you don't have to have an opinion on everything and you don't have to make an investment decision based on you know every business that comes across your desk. You don't have to uh, go long every stock that comes across or, or short every stock that comes across. You don't have to have an opinion. You need to stick to, to businesses that are in your circle of competence and your kind of area of understanding. But all that said, um, Airbnb is a really interesting business and I actually really like the Airbnb business model. But like you say, it's, it's really early days. So, so to answer your question, frankly, um, what I personally am doing with Airbnb, because I do really like the business, is I'm just going to watch it. I'm going to watch them build up a history of financials and see if the business got, does go well over a period of time. And if something ever happens to Airbnb stock out into the future when the business is going really, really well, but for whatever reason, the stock's getting beaten up, that's when people like me tend to get a bit more interested. So as one for the watch list and one I'll just kind of be keeping an eye on there. Okay, next question is from John and he asks, what's your estimated annual growth rate for the US RV industry and Thor in particular? I'm looking at WGO, which I think is Winnebago, but both appear to have some margin of safety now. So yeah, I've been a shareholder in Thor Industries for probably close to two years now. Um, 
and they are an industry which has had a sort of surprising boost in the last couple of quarters there's a lot of people uh, looking to travel more domestically i guess and have money to spend on motorhomes and um trailers as they call them in the us as well so interesting space in terms of the growth rate i think you've got to look at the drivers for each of those businesses so if we look at thor industries specifically there's really two ways that thor have grown over a long period of time uh the first is just simply organic growth each of the business that are within Thor Industries. So if you're not familiar with Thor, um, basically they're sort of a conglomerate, very much like a Berkshire Hathaway of the of the RV world. They own many different kind of RV subsidiary businesses and they kind of actually all compete against each other to a certain extent as well, which is another interesting aspect of Thor. Um, so two ways they've grown. Either those subsidiaries have naturally grown their sales within kind of each of those um, brands. The other way that Thor has grown is it's grown through acquisitions. Uh, the big one over the last couple of years has been the Erwinheimer Group, but that's basically been the core driver of Thor over a long period of time. It's continued to uh, acquire these businesses at intelligent prices and they've sort of compounded the business that way. So I think there's two ways you can look at it. The first way is organic growth. The second way is acquisition. In terms of acquisition, I think um, Thor have just ticked off a very large target and I really don't know how much longer the runway is for that so certainly they're not going to do the 15 percent you know long-term growth that they've achieved over the past 20 years uh going forward uh that's almost a given and the other thing is that if you look at the long-term growth of the rv industry in general you're probably looking at about inflationary type growth rates sort of two to three percent per year compounded and that's a report that thor actually puts into their investor presentations quite often so will Thor do better than that 3%? I think yes, I think they'll probably continue to grow their market share over a long period of time, um, but it's certainly not gonna be the big 15% a year kind of compounded growth that they've done in the past. So um, interpret that as you wish and try and, you know, with your own research, come up with a growth rate, but that's kind of the, the core drivers that I'm at least thinking about with Thor Industries. Carol A says, I wanna do an end of year slash new year review of my current holdings to see if I still think they are still wonderful companies. Uh, any tips on things I need to look at? Do you do something similar? So um, I don't really do that um, each year, I suppose, but certainly each time that the company is reporting their earnings or particularly when they come out with their annual reports, I'm digging in very deeply on those. Um, and really something I personally actually need to get better at is kind of recording my initial investment thesis. Oftentimes it's actually, oftentimes it's actually here on YouTube, so that I guess is recorded <laughs> in a way. Um, but the key drivers should align with what your original investment thesis was. So if you you know, invest in a company expecting it to grow at 10% a year, for example, checking that um, firstly, are they achieving those metrics right now? And do they still have capacity to achieve those metrics in your opinion out into the future as well? One thing I certainly would not be focusing on is what the stock price has done. Uh, you've got to focus on the core business and um, that's kind of the, the things that I would be reviewing at least if you were going to go through that process. Classified Level 10 asks, what are your biggest mistakes and what are changes you've made to become a better investor? So yeah, I think we actually also had a similar question. I'll just see if I can find it. Uh, similar question from David Kane who asks, what would say is the most common mistake that you need to remind yourself not to repeat? So um, when I was thinking about those two questions and particularly kind of the way that, that David phrased that, um, I was actually thinking about confirmation bias probably being the biggest mistake that I catch myself often falling into. Um, so, that, so the idea of confirmation bias is basically me having a certain opinion on a company or whatever it might be. Um, and then as humans, we tend to kind of naturally lean towards um, finding information that confirms our original thesis i think it's just human nature in a lot of ways it makes us feel good you know if you look at your um you know closest friends for example you'll often have very similar interests similar political views uh you know you'll enjoy doing the you know similar types of things and i think humans just like to associate themselves with people that have very similar ideas um but in investing that is not what you want to do you don't want to only hunt out ideas uh from people that agree with you um, ideally when you research in a company you want to understand both the positives and negatives of that particular investment case and really you want to go through charlie Munger inversion process take all the positive things that you think about a company flip them upside down and try and give the argument of what could dismantle those different uh, things within that business so that's the mistake that I see myself um, falling into oftentimes I kind of catch myself falling into that trap 
Um, and it, I don't know that it's something that'll ever go away. It's something that I've just got to be aware of. And I think, frankly, it's a big win just knowing that that happens to you kind of in your head and being able to uh, try and counteract that as much as you can. Uh, MD asks, what are your bench dead squat stats equipped or raw? I think I've answered this a few times in Q&As, but I'll uh, give you again here. So I've never competed equipped. This is in powerlifting for anyone that doesn't uh, get the question. Um, best competition lifts, uh, a 265 kilo squat, a 157 kilo bench and a 280 kilo deadlift. Um, and that's all raw, drug tested, all that kind of stuff if you're into powerlifting. So um, that's first part of MD's question. Uh, he also says, also, are you actively moving to cash at the moment or positioning up on the recent value rally? So um, in terms of what I'm doing with cash at the moment and what I'm doing with cash at all times really is focusing on individual company opportunities. So if I don't have anything interesting to you know put money to, towards, um, cash just kind of naturally accumulates. And if I have a bunch to put money towards, um, then I'll put cash into that. And you know that's kind of the way it works. So I'm not necessarily looking at macro stuff. You know the value rally has been real. A lot of positions in my portfolio have done really well the last few weeks because I have a lot of those beaten down value stocks kind of sitting in there. Um, but that's not really how I think about managing my cash position. So recently I've found some stuff that's kind of interesting and I've put cash to work. Um, but I'm also looking to do this real estate purchase that I just mentioned with um, Jack's question. So I've kind of got enough money for that sort of set aside also. Uh, Karan asks, are you going to do a 2020 recap video covering investing lessons you've picked up this year? Um, probably not on specific investing lessons, I don't think, but if anyone would like to see that, uh, definitely let me know. Um, certainly I'm going to be doing one on my 2020 goals and kind of updating, you know, what I've achieved versus what I wanted to achieve and, you know, setting up some new goals for next year and putting them out here so that you guys can keep me accountable essentially. Uh, WJJ, what do you do for a living other than investing and running an awesome YouTube channel? I appreciate that. Um, sorry if it was mentioned in other videos currently catching up on all. It's actually surprising how many messages I get um, where people say, I've just been binge watching your videos, which is kind of a crazy uh, thing to hear, but obviously you guys are enjoying them, so that's cool. Um, yeah, I basically work for an agricultural software company. Um, I've mentioned that in the past, I think, but that's kind of what I do. I've got a background in agricultural science, grew up on a farm and kind of studied agricultural science at uni and have been working in that field uh, ever since I graduated sort of four years or so ago. Next question is from Geordie. Can you explain why it's bad if management is focusing heavily on EBITDA? Keep up the good work and greetings from the Netherlands. Well, we've, we've gone global. <laughs> I appreciate your question and thank you for watching. So in terms of EBITDA, this is very much like a Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger idea again that um, they think EBITDA can be very misleading. So for those that don't know what EBITDA is, it stands for earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. So it's basically kind of a way of adjusting your earnings to... Um, you know the argument is it makes your earnings more comparable between different types of businesses and it's not sort of biased towards your business structure and how well financed you are and all that sort of stuff um, but in terms of using that to value a business it can be misleading if you're in a you know heavy industry type business and you have a lot of depreciation for example versus a asset light business which doesn't have much depreciation uh, the EBITDA figures can look very similar between those two types of businesses um, but the the real owner earnings after you know maintaining your equipment and, and maintaining your assets for example um, the real cash flow out of those entities can be very very different so um, we like to focus on free cash flow or owner earnings or you know one of those types of things and EBITDA can be misleading so that's kind of uh, why you might hear some people say that okay next question is from henry he asked just wondering how the exchange rate affects your purchasing and selling of us stocks uh do you gain or lose on the exchange rates by the way is that a kingfish yes it is catch or release uh i think you mean catch and release or not release uh that one was not released but we do release quite a few of them um so yeah exchange rates i think um it's very important to track so um, a lot of people w won't track their um, exchange rate fluctuations with the US investments and it can have a massive impact on your returns. So, you know, over the past few months, for example, the New Zealand dollar has gotten very strong against the US dollar and it's meant that any returns that I make in US currencies um, actually aren't as good as they would have been if that exchange rate sort of fluctuation didn't happen. But other times it's the reverse um, and my stocks can be doing nothing and the New Zealand dollar is getting weaker and then suddenly my US stocks look more valuable to me when I report them in New Zealand dollars. So 
Um, in terms of how I think about it, I think I'll probably buy, be buying US assets over a long period of time. So the honest answer is I don't put that much thought into it. Um, I think it'll fluctuate a lot, you know, within sort of one year or two year or three year periods. But over a long period of time, um, I don't think I have the ability to, you know, make a call either way. I think both of those currencies will depreciate, the New Zealand dollar and the US dollar their ability to purchase goods and services will go down over time through inflation uh, but which one goes down at a faster rate is kind of anyone's guess in my book so that's how i think about it i certainly do track it though uh, and i use ShareSite. um shameless plug i'm a ShareSite affiliate so if you're interested in getting four months free on an annual subscription link will be down in the description below for that so feel free to check that one out um, but in all seriousness ShareSite is really really good at tracking those uh, currency gains so if i put an investment into ShareSite that i own it will tell me what my capital gain or losses it will then tell me uh, what my currency you know gain or losses and it'll also tell me any dividend income as well so you, you get those sort of three buckets of return reported to you for each investment and then you get like a total return as well in either percentage or dollar terms so that's really powerful um, and it allows you just to just get a better handle on the real returns that you're making from stocks Okay, next question is from Investing with Frank. Uh, Toby Carlyle and Jake Taylor lately have quoted a study saying the accuracy of projections, projections drops dramatically after a five-year time period. I've personally adjusted my DCFs to a five-year time frame. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I agree with what Jake and Toby are saying. I listen to the podcast every week, uh, Value After Hours. Everyone should check that out because it's really good. Um, yeah, so I guess what they were, were referring to, at least my interpretation of what they were saying, was that if you're looking at things like uh, earnings growth rates, for example, over an extended period of time, then any projection further out than say five years is basically uh, meaningless. It's entirely random whether those um, projections are right or not, whereas closer term forecasts tend to have slightly more accuracy. So um, I guess in terms of adjusting your discounted cash flow to five years, um, it sort of does and it doesn't actually help you, I think. Um, so although your discounted cash flow will have five years of cash flow kind of sitting in there, um, I'm assuming you have some sort of terminal value on the back end. So, you know, you're sort of projecting out what you can likely sell that business for on, in year five um, when you run that analysis. So, I mean, a terminal value is basically saying this is what we think the... Um, present value of the future cash flows after all the years that we've just analyzed are going to be. So you've still sort of got, you know, post year five um, projections built into that terminal value. So I don't know if necessarily shortening from 10 years to five years is going to help all that much. Um, the way I guess I account for that is just being conservative with my valuations. You know, I will never ever run a discounted cash flow where I think earnings are going to grow at 20% for a decade. I just don't think that that is realistic for a lot of businesses, although many do execute on that. And I think that is where you can run into trouble because of this, you know, forecasting stuff. So I think firstly, just being conservative in your discounted cash flow will help a lot. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, margin of safety solves all problems in, in many of these situations as well. So if you can buy a business that you think is going to grow at say 10% a year over the next five to 10 years, um, but you can buy it at a price which implies that it only grows at like 3%, then you know, you've got a big margin of safety in that and it doesn't really matter that much if your forecasts are you know, a little optimistic. All right, uh, Greg asked, how much research do you do on a company before committing to buy? Do you go through decades of annual reports reading every line or you just skim over the important numbers? Uh, depends on the business basically so if there is a business that i understand inside out i use all their products i've been following the business for an extended period of time uh, you know a company like apple really comes to mind for me with this one um, there is not a whole bunch of research i'm gonna do if the price gets down really really low like if it suddenly gets to where i think uh, the margin of safety is sitting um, there's just not that much work for me to do i, I already know reasonably well the history of apple you know, me reading through decades of annual reports and understanding previous products that they put out in the 1980s and 1990s really isn't going to impact my decision that much. I'm already familiar with the management. I'm already pretty familiar with what their product lineup is. So in that situation, research would be pretty minimal for me, frankly, um, as long as the price got down to a reasonable level where I would consider purchasing. So um, that's kind of an example of a business where I'm not doing that much research because it's just already in my head anyway, and it's a relatively easy business to understand. Um, 
and then you've got things right on the other end of the spectrum so you know if you take something like a Seritage growth properties for example that was something that um, I had to do more work on it again as a relatively simple business so there wasn't um, too much new stuff for me to get my head around but that was one that certainly took a little bit more time and I luckily got some assistance from Brad Calendar if anyone watched the live stream on that one as well. So it depends on the company uh, and also kind of depends on the price I would say as well. So if you think a business is at some like insane 80% margin of safety and there's just been like a massive fall off in the market in like two days or something, that's probably a situation where you're gonna wanna act quickly even if it is on slightly incomplete information in some instances. Um, so it depends on the business, depends on you know what's happening with the price in the market few things there but that's kind of the way that I'm sort of thinking through it at least okay question from Ashley Suarez Buffett says you should understand the business very well my question is how deep uh, you should understand any business Buffett also mentions to understand the economic characteristics of the business how do you stay updated on any business and industry what to read apart from annual reports and quarterly reports in order to stay updated so again um, I hate to give you this answer but it really does depend on the business um, if I go back to the previous example um, with a business like Apple, again, I know it very well, um, and I'm a customer and I'm using their products all the time, so that is kind of my way of keeping up to date with what's happening in the company. Um, and in terms of understanding the economics, that probably is diving into a little bit of the more um, quantitative side of the company. So looking through things like margins and cost of production and you know uh, average selling prices on their iPhone units and all that sort of stuff. So again, uh, I hate to give you this answer, but it does depend on the business. But that at the very least is what Buffett means by understanding the economics of the business as well as the business itself and, and sort of the products that they are selling. Reed989 asks, what has been your best source to find stock ideas? Uh, yeah, I guess there's probably a few main ones. I uh, really like 13F filings. Um, I actually get the occasional, actually I get quite a few stock tips from, from you guys. Um, if you're ever going to send me a stock tip, in all seriousness, um, email me, investingwithtom at gmail.com. Um, but I want to know your real thoughts and the kind of the core numbers that I want to get out of any stock tip that you might want to send to me um, is what's the current stock price and what do you think it's worth? And ideally I want you to send me ideas where you think the stock price uh, is way too low relative to what it's worth. You know, it's trading at 10 and you think it's worth $100 per share. And I want to see your logic on that. This is kind of exactly what Monash provides us people as well. So um, that's kind of what I'm looking for if you do send me a stock tip. But um, that's sort of my second source. <laughs> And then the third one I often get is just from sort of general reading and, and news. So, um, you know, we had big news come out of A2 Milk here in New Zealand, for example, just this week. Even if I wasn't following A2 Milk, that probably would have come on my radar because it was quite high profile news. Um, and that stuff does happen every now and again. So just, just keeping up to date with what's going on in the markets in general uh, can really help there too. Okay, and I realize this video is getting very long, so let's make this one the last question. Uh, this is from Alex O'Brien. Hi Tom, curious if you did a course on investing or did you just do it yourself? I still see Phil Town offers a one year course. Do you know if it's any good? Um, I have never been to a Phil Town course, so I probably can't speak too much on that, although I had re have read all of Phil Town's sort of books. I've uh, got a few of them there behind me. Um, and yeah, I've, I've never taken any course on investing. I've um, purely learned everything that I have from investing, basically from originally actually just watching YouTube videos from other people that um, you know knew what they were talking about uh, and just kind of funneling some of those ideas into my head and then just from general reading so once you discover this whole world of Buffett and value investing and all sorts of stuff um, there's a bunch of reading material that you can get your hands on and really get a lot of ideas um, in your head and try and learn as much as you can. And over time, as you continue this process and as you start investing some of your own money and get a feel for um, some of the drivers of what, you know, make good investments and bad investments, uh, you just sort of the knowledge compounds and you just learn more over time. So for me, there was never one key thing that, you know, made me comfortable with investing my own money. It's just a gradual process of learning over time. Um, and yeah, YouTube and reading books has, has frankly been the thing that has helped me the most. And uh, it's where I've got literally like 98 percent i would say of my investing knowledge from i've got a little bit from working in real businesses in real life which you know i'm probably actually underweighting at two percent it actually has been a very big help you know just understanding how real businesses run and, and working in them as well so and it's just kind of a passion project for me and something i really enjoy do, doing and i'll continue to do it over a long period of time and it just builds up 
Okay, that was the final question. So thank you to everyone who did ask a question on my community post. Um, again, if you're interested in asking a question in a future video, definitely keep an eye out on that page. Uh, and if I didn't get a chance to get to your question, I apologize for that. Please keep asking questions in future. Um, and hopefully at some point you will get a question on the video. I'll try to get through as many as I can. So that's all for me today. I do hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you did, a like definitely helps me out. Uh, and other than that, I will see you in the next video. Cheers.